This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Pit deltas. We all know the term, we kind of have a basic idea of what it means, but how is it calculated to the point where race strategists can plan around it and construct a number of race scenarios around it? It's time for a classic chamber video breakdown. And let's start at the beginning. What does delta mean? Delta is a mathematics term. Basically, we just wang out the Greek alphabet equivalent of D, delta, seen here in its glorious triangular capital form, when we're talking about the differences or changes between two things. So you might have two points on a graph and to compare them and make calculations, you might talk about the delta in the x direction and the delta in the y direction. And then you can do things like draw a line and work out its gradient. Anyway. Back to F1. Now in F1, delta generally refers to differences between two values. For example, you might hear people talk about speed delta, maybe between running with DRS and without. If opening DRS increases your max speed by eight kilometers an hour, then you're talking about an eight kilometer an hour speed delta. All pretty simple, really. Now you might also think about lap deltas or time deltas. This comes up a lot under virtual safety car conditions where cars have to drive relatively slowly, completing laps at a minimum lap time measured every mini sector. If say the virtual safety car minimum allowed lap time is 1 minute 50 seconds and you complete the lap in 1 minute 51 seconds, then you are delta positive. Your time is bigger than the reference time, so the difference between your lap and the reference is a positive number. If you go too fast, say 1 minute 49 seconds, you're delta negative. The difference between your time and the reference is negative. Your delta is minus 1 second. So on to pit deltas themselves. When we go to a circuit, teams will work out the difference in lap time between running a normal lap at race speed and running a lap in which you have to take a pit stop. The time difference between the normal lap and the pit stop lap is the pit delta. Basically, it tells you how much time you're gonna lose in taking a pit stop compared to someone who doesn't pit that lap. Now, it's worth noting this is different from the total time spent in pit lane, which is often displayed on a graphic during the race. That time just measures the time span between the car crossing the pit entry line and the pit exit line, seen here on the pit lane map of the Circuit of the Americas event notes, provided by the race director. So you'll notice when I did a little graphic of that normal lap versus pit stop lap, I didn't actually start and complete the lap where the start finish line actually is. And that's because the start finish line is somewhere in the middle of the whole pit stop process. So often part of the pit stop delta is captured at the end of one lap and part of it is captured at the beginning of the next lap. So if you want to get a picture of the whole difference, it's best to add up the lap times of both the pit in and pit out lap in order to capture the entire pit delta across both laps. Now, obviously it takes longer to do a pit stop than it does to not take a pit stop because, well, not only do you stop, but your speed is massively restricted through the pit lane compared to cars running at full speed on the track. There is a speed limit in force between the pit lane start and the pit lane end. Each track is different though, with pit lane speed limits that vary, uh, pit lanes of varying lengths, and pit exit and pit entry paths that deviate from the track in many ways. So the pit lane delta from track to track can vary massively, with some tracks bearing a huge time penalty from pitting and others being a little more forgiving. So let's go to the US Grand Prix we just had and look at Verstappen to get a bit of an idea of what a pit delta might be. The interesting thing about Cota is that the lap time for a pit in lap is not actually very different from a normal lap because the pit entry is shorter than the actual track and the pit lane start line, which is where you slow for the speed limit, is close to the start finish line. And if you compare this map with Singapore, for example, you'll see the speed limit comes into force a lot earlier than the start finish line here. So through this section of the circuit, a car out on track will be noticeably quicker than the one in the pit lane. But over at Cota, they might be pretty similar. Anyway, Verstappen then. He pitted on lap 13, so let's use laps 11 and 12 as our reference for normal racing laps. Lap 11 was a 142.6 and lap 12 was a 143 flat, so added together, that's 205.6 seconds. He pitted on lap 13, so lap 13 was his in lap, lap 14 was his out lap. If we add these laps together, they will contain the full pit stop within. So that's 142.7 for his in lap and 2 minute 2.1 for his out lap. Added together, that's 224.8 seconds, so a difference of 19.2 seconds. That's just one example though, so let's have a look at Perez and Hamilton who stopped similar sort of times in the race. Perez's delta around the first stop was 17.7 seconds and Hamilton's was about 20.5 seconds. So you're expecting 18 to 20 second time cost for making a pit stop here. That's your delta. Though it should be noted Red Bull are generally about half a second faster at the actual pit stop part 
than Mercedes. So that's something you'll also have to factor in as a strategist. Now, really, the only difference between pitting and not pitting happens between about here and here. The rest of the lap should be pretty similar, disregarding the effect of a new set of tyres. But when pitting, there are, I guess, four phases that are different from taking a normal lap. You know, there's the stop itself, when the car is stationary for two to four seconds in its box. There's the travelling through the actual pit lane bit in the section that's actually speed limited. And then there's the entry and exit to the pit lane, which isn't speed limited, but will require you to decelerate from racing speed on entry and accelerate back up to racing speed on exit. So we're really talking from pit lane entry road right up to the first corner you encounter back on track. And also the pit entry and exit lanes may deviate wildly from the actual circuit. While Kota and Singapore follow the track pretty closely, Silverstone takes a massive shortcut on entry. So much so that the speed limit is slow and it starts very early to stop the pit lane actually being a shortcut in itself. Sao Paulo's pit exit is very long and winds past the exit of turn three before emerging back down the straight. All of these differences affect the overall pit delta and need to be factored into the strategy. And the reason I stress that only this part is important for pit stop time loss is what happens if there's a safety car. Teams will often try and stretch a stint out if there's risk of a safety car or virtual safety car because pitting under a safety car costs so much less time than it does under normal conditions. That's why they call it a cheap pit stop. And why is it so cheap? Well, the time spent in the actual speed limited part of the pit lane is going to be identical whether there's a safety car or not. You'll still be going the same speed regardless. And the time spent in the pit entry and exit lanes will be virtually identical too. However, out on track, everyone is going to be limited by the pace dictated by the safety car or virtual safety car. But to reiterate, the absolute time of taking a pit stop, basically the time spent in the pit lane, is going to be almost identical. So let's look at this using some real data. There was a safety car in the US Grand Prix, so let's look at it on the actual F1 timing app, which is well worth a sub if you like following the live data. So this is lap 14, and it might be hard to see, but there's a little mark on the circuit here before turn 20, so we're going to use that as a reference. So we'll time the cars going from here to the apex of turn 1. The pit lane is here, by the way. So let's look at a normal racing lap, and I'm going to speed it up, I'm not a monster, and we'll see it takes Verstappen 16.22 seconds to complete just racing the lap normally. And if we look at the end of lap 13, when he took a pit stop, we see he disappears while in the pits, but he pops out again at the other end and ultimately takes 36.3 seconds to complete the same distance. And we're in agreement this time is basically the same time no matter what, because it's not really limited by the safety car. Now, the safety car was called on lap 18, but didn't pick up the pack until turn one of lap 19. So there was a period where the cars were running to a reduced lap delta until they caught it. So in this period, Verstappen took 20.26 seconds to travel the distance. A little bit longer. And under full safety car conditions, with the Aston Martin leading that train of cars, obviously it took longer still, and Verstappen took 24.5 seconds to travel the same distance. So bearing in mind that the time it takes to travel between here and here while taking a pit stop, which is about 36 seconds, will remain the same, whether it's green flag running or under a safety car, we can see that a normal delta is about 20 seconds. The delta while the safety car has been called, but not yet caught the cars, is about 16 seconds, so a pit stop here would have been about 4 seconds faster than normal. And while the cars were behind the safety car, the pit delta was only 12 seconds, saving about 8 seconds over a normal pit stop. Now the teams will be able to simulate all of this before they even turn up at the track. They'll have a decent idea of the pace of the cars, the pace of the safety car, the time through the pit lane, including accelerating back out to track speed, so they'll arrive with all those numbers in hand. But free practice, and including when the safety car does its practice laps, will help make those numbers more concrete so strategies can be put in place for the Sunday race. If rain falls, that makes things extra tricky because there's no definitive wet lap time, as this will vary massively depending on conditions, so a lot of these calculations are going to be crunched on the fly as the track evolves and the chances of a safety car come in and out of favour. So that's it, that's the pit delta and how it can change from circuit to circuit and be massively shortened by a safety car. Maybe something you instinctively knew, but now you have the visuals to help maybe understand it more completely. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll probably like the wide variety of content available on Nebula and their good buddies, CuriosityStream. Now Nebula is a streamy award nominated platform where creators have gathered together to create a space to produce and showcase content in a way that works. That means no ads, no algorithms, no weird YouTube doesn't like this concerns. The output is just as it was intended. And that means you'll often get extended cuts and exclusive episodes from your favorite creators that never make it to YouTube. And with over 14,000 titles to browse through, 
what will you explore first? If you want to segue from my channel into more explainery type videos, then there's a whole section on that, including Half as Interesting, who produces bite-sized treats on just the niche kind of little topics I like. Or maybe you're just like me and you love movies, so you'll feast on a near feature-length episode of Patrick Willems exploring Zack Snyder. It's all here. And like Nebula, CuriosityStream loves exploring all the interesting bits of the world, but they do it in that big budget documentary production style. You probably know them, they've been around a long time producing wildly brilliant content. And this month I'm going to recommend you watch The Science of Thrills, an eight part series on how you engineer roller coasters to be amazing, really diving into everything from speed to the psychological trickery built into rides to excite you. And if you want to get access to both CuriosityStream and Nebula in one incredibly affordable package, well I got good news, you can! You just sign up to CuriosityStream, that's it, you'll get access to Nebula for free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. If you use my special link in the description, curiositystream.com slash chainbear, you'll get 26% off the annual plan, which means you will get both platforms for the whole year for just $14.79. And the little link at the bottom supports me too. Enjoy! Enjoy!